Station Houston on Space to Ground 2, are you ready for the event? Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, I am ready for the event. Kansas Cosmosphere, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Do I do that? Station, this is Cosmosphere. How do you hear me? I've got you loud and clear, Mom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> First of all, good morning from everyone here at the Cosmosphere on planet Earth. There are a bunch of kids here excited to ask you questions about your life on station, farming in space, and so much more. Why don't we get to it? Sounds great. I look forward to the questions. I'm Nick Robin from Hoxie. I'm in fifth grade. I'm asking this question for Lily Denio, who is in third grade. Who or what inspired you to be an astronaut? That's a great question because that's the start of a big adventure. Um, when I was your age, you know, going to school in Hoxie or going to school in Peabody, I would always have a sense of adventure and, and want to explore and discover and learn new things. And, and at night, naturally, it was great to look up at the night sky and see the stars and wonder what was out there. And so that that's staring up at the sky and, and looking at that night sky every night and, and just that sense of awe that I got inspired me to go and, and try to do new things and to, to explore. But I think in terms of the source of inspiration, you know, it's going to be different for us all, but the source of inspiration, the, the people in your life that give you the love and support that you need in order to, to have the confidence to be able to brave out on your own. Uh, for me, that was my parents. You know, they always, had the, they always had my back. They always gave me the support I need. They gave me the confidence to go out there and pursue my dreams. Uh, so I encourage all of you to find that source of inspiration in, in your lives and to pursue your dreams. Hi, I'm Gina Moog, a fourth grader from Peabody Burns Elementary. Besides education, what do you think is really important for all astronauts to have or be able to do? Yeah, so education is, is one, of the, one of the most fundamental things. So everybody's got to work hard in school, and, and it's going to be difficult, but the reward is, is definitely there. Uh, after education, I think that the thing that, that was impressed upon me, and I, and I remember back to when I was in elementary school in Peabody, I was at the high school gymnasium and listening to a, a similar type of speech. It was uh, a representative from NASA had come to the school and was addressing us all about the space program. And what they said then is what I'm gonna tell you now is that we explore space with other people as a team. And so you've gotta have a good education, but you've also gotta be able to be part of a team and work well with others. You know, I'm on the station right now with a crew of six and so we work side by side, elbow to elbow, but it's not just the six of us. Across the globe, there's more than 100,000 people that support the space station program. So it's a team sport, and being able to be part of a team is important. I'm Nadia Ratzler from Peabody Elementary. I'm in third grade. What is the hardest thing you've had to learn in order to be an astronaut? Without doubt, the most difficult thing I've had to do in order to get to the space station is learn how to speak Russian. Ruski yazyk ochen trudna. Eto trebuyet mnogo vremenye, stobi znat. 
but with a lot of hard work and, and determination, you can accomplish anything you put your mind to. I am Mr. Borbin, a first grader from Peabody Burns Elementary. What is your favorite trick or thing to do in microgravity? Can you show us? So the best part about the station is microgravity. It's that you don't have to actually hold the microphone in order to talk into the microphone. So the thing I like to do is float. It never gets old. You should all make Look, fun noises as we fly around the space station. It's like we're back in elementary school. I'm Lira Zelinsky from Peabody Burns Elementary. I'm in second grade. How do you talk to your family on Earth? What are some ways you stay connected? Staying connected with the family is really important. And so the ground, to the team on the ground, helps us do that. So every week on the weekend, I get to have a video conference, kind of similar to what we're doing, with my wife and, and our two sons, so that we get to see each other, like Skype or FaceTime. And then I also have email, and I can make phone calls. So it's, it, we've actually got a lot of connectivity so that I know exactly what's going on. Like today in Houston, there's lots of rain and flooding and school's been canceled. I've been able to talk to, to my wife, Katie, and our boys and make sure that everything is fine. I'm Ian Jukola from Hoxie. I'm in fifth grade. What is a normal day like on the station? Is everyone on the same work and sleep schedule? So a normal day is actually a pretty long day. A normal day on the station starts, I wake up at 6 a.m. and then I have an hour or so to get ready for the day. And then we have our morning conference at usually around 7.30. And then our day goes until the evening conference, which is at 7.30 at night. So it's about a 12 hour day. And in that day we work, we exercise, we eat lunch, and so it's pretty busy, but everybody's on the same schedule. What's fun to see is how they actually organize that schedule for us. So everybody has a line, and on that line, we have the, you see the red line that goes down the schedule. As, that, as time moves, that red line moves, and all of these activities along these lines are things that we have to get done today. Some of them are maintenance, some of them are new experiments. There's lots of things that we have to do, and we have to stay ahead of the red line. So we all work together as a team to make sure that we finish the day on time. I'm Carter Beckman from Hoxie. I'm in eighth, in eighth grade. I'm asking this question for Dylan Mater, who is in kindergarten. We saw that you were trying to grow plants. Where do you plant them? So we're in a special place in the space station right now. We're in the Columbus Laboratory, which is the European Space Agency's module. And in this laboratory, which is one of four laboratories on the space station, we have a special place called the Veggie Plant Growth Facility, where this is where we grow all the vegetables. And so you can see the lights and the equipment that we've got set up here. And in this one rack, we harvest and we eat the vegetables we grow. Hi, I'm Maya Hill. I'm from Fort Lauderdale Elementary School. I'm in fourth grade. How do plants grow in space without ox oxygen? So up here, inside the space station, we have an atmosphere that's very similar to the atmosphere that you're breathing right now. 
and that's balanced between, for instance, humans, we breathe in oxygen and out carbon dioxide, and then the plants will breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. And so up here on the space station, we don't have enough plants to produce all of that oxygen or to consume all of our carbon dioxide. So we have to replace that with equipment. And it's a really difficult balancing act to have the equipment that will produce enough oxygen for us and also remove the carbon dioxide to keep our atmosphere healthy. It just really makes it obvious once you're up here and you see how difficult that process is to understand how truly special the earth is to have that balance happening naturally across the entire globe and having plants and animals living in harmony supporting each other is uh, it's it's the earth is truly a special place i'm nick westerhouse from harmony middle school i'm in seventh grade what is the lighting cycle for crops on the space station, and how does that compare to the cycle of day and night that you personally experience? So the day and night cycle for the crops that we grow depends on the different types of, of vegetables that we're putting into the growth facility. Different plants grow better with different cycles, and so the scientists on the ground fine-tune the cycles that we're exposing the, the plants to so that they grow at an optimal rate. For us, we experience a day-night cycle inside the space station similar to the day-night cycle you experience. We turn the lights on in the morning, and then at night we turn the lights off. And we have special lighting up here that will allow us to turn on nighttime lighting so that it doesn't have blue light to, and it helps us go to sleep at night. And in the morning, we have extra blue light to help us wake up. And so we try to match our circadian rhythm on the ground. But if I go to the window, remember we're orbiting the earth 16 times a day. So I see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets outside the window every day. So at night we close the shutters so that the sun doesn't bother us and, and, and wake us up. I'm Cameron Carlisle from Lakewood Middle School. I'm in sixth grade. And my question is, what have you learned from the agriculture experiments conducted on the station? How have they benefited the space program? So we've learned a lot. And part of our learning and experimenting up here is learning what is successful and what's not successful. What we do know is that Plants grow, or the processes that help plants grow, are different here on orbit. They're different in that on the ground, when it rains, the water naturally goes down to the plant's roots. But up here, water floats, so it doesn't want to naturally go down to the roots. So we have to come up with ways in order to make that happen. So let me show you a piece of equipment. So we call this a veggie pond. And so if I hold it up close, you can see little plants that have grown in there. The seeds have started to sprout. But we just can't put the seeds in dirt and expect it to grow up here. We have to put it in this cassette that we call a pond. And this cassette helps us deliver the water to the roots and saturate the roots evenly so that you can get optimal plant growth. And, and it's, so it's difficult. Just for a few seeds, it takes all of this equipment. And it's going to be important when we go to Mars, or if we stay a long time on the moon, to be able to take our resources so that we can grow our own food. Because packing enough food for two or three years is, is going to be too much food to take. But if we took the seeds and then we relied on the resources that were present on Mars to help us grow those seeds, then we might have a chance of being successful. So we're learning how to do that now so that years from now, when kids your age have grown up, you'll be able to successfully make it to Mars. I'm Fisher Simonsic from Erie High School in Erie, Kansas. I'm in 11th grade. What is the viability of space travel for people with certain diseases such as diabetes, arthritis, and even cancer? Well,
Well, the space environment is definitely harsh on the body, and we have to do lots of things to try to interact that. Even on a, even on a healthy body, it does a lot of strange things. For instance, when I first arrived on orbit, in the first two weeks, my body stretched two inches. So I'm two inches taller now on orbit than I was on the ground. I also lose a lot of fluid and fluid pushes into your head and that changes how your body works as well. It has impacts on your tastes, your sense of taste. It has impacts on your vision and it also has impacts on the pressure inside of your, inside of your head. So all of those effects combined with additional radiation that we're exposed to up here are changing our bodies. And so a, a large part of what we're doing up here is studying humans living in space. And so I'm constantly collecting blood samples and, and, and doing different scans so that scientists can see how my body's changing and how my crewmates' bodies are changing to understand those mechanisms. And by understanding those mechanisms, it actually helps us understand what causes diseases and, and what causes some of the some of the things that can go wrong with the body so that we can hopefully find cures and countermeasures for them. I'm Izzy Miliazzo from Leewood Elementary School and I'm in fifth grade. How do you how are you trained to handle illnesses and injuries on the space station and how would it be different on Mars? Yeah, so if someone gets hurt, we can't go to the urgent care. So we all are trained to be able to do basic help. Uh, if I need to give someone some stitches, I've been trained how to give someone some stitches. Uh, we're trained for CPR. We're trained how to, how to provide oxygen. So all of these things we have to do just like I was an EMT. But luckily, I've got a doctor as a crewmate, uh, David St. Jacques, who's a Canadian astronaut. And he's a, he's, he's a doctor. And so he provides us additional support. In a long mission where we go to Mars, it may be more difficult and we m might be even more reliant on having a physician and the equipment on board to be able to treat uh, someone if something goes wrong. But the first thing that they do is they try to make sure that whoever gets launched into space right now is very healthy so that there's a very small chance of having to deal with a major uh, medical situation. Hi, I'm Ella Satterwhite from Hylon Montessori School. I'm in sixth grade, and I wanted to ask if there's any downtime on the space station and what you do during your downtime. We do have some free time. And it's super important to have some free time so that you can rest mentally and physically. So the things I like to do, first, I already told you I enjoy floating. So that's, that's a lot of fun to do. Uh, the second thing that I like to do is look out the window. And it never gets old looking at the Earth glide by. And you can see entire continents below you all in one view. It's, it's, it's an amazing view. The, the third thing I like to do is play with my food. So maybe I can demonstrate that a little bit for you. So I mentioned that, that up here, water behaves very different and it makes it challenging for us to grow uh, vegetables, to grow plants. So let me show you how water behaves differently. This is, a, this is a drink bag and inside I've got some tropical punch. So let's see what it does. So up here, fluids do amazing things when they just float. I can, I can sit here and I can play with this ball of tropical punch and keep it floating here for, I could do this for an hour and it never gets old. But at some point, 
It's got to go somewhere. Playing with your food never gets old. Hello, I'm Julie Sloan from Hoxie, and I'm in ninth grade. I'm asking this question for Carly Cooper, who's in fourth grade. Since you're in orbit like the satellites that provide cellular service, do you have good Wi-Fi in space? I actually have great Wi-Fi in space. So inside the station, we have wireless networks. And then those networks connect to relay satellites. There's a constellation of relay satellites around the globe. And those relay satellites beam down our signal. And so those satellites right now are what are making it possible for me to talk to you while you're in Hutchison and I'm circling the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. In the time that we do this conference, I'll almost go entirely around the globe. I'm Addie Baker from Hoxie. I'm in fifth grade. I'm asking this question for Mia Allfalter, who's in third grade. Is there wind in space? You know, there is wind in space, but it's not the same wind you have in Kansas. Up here, the space station is going around the Earth, and we're higher than most of the atmosphere, so we don't have air blowing around in the space station or around the space station but we do have solar wind and so the sun emits particles throughout the solar system and that wind goes out in every direction and luckily the earth has a magnetic has magnetic fields that protect it and block all of that radiation or most of that radiation and so it keeps us safe on the ground I'm Duncan Bell from Hoxie. I'm in sixth grade. I'm asking this question for Jensen Armconnect, who is in third grade. What does the sun look like in space? You know, when I look out the window and I see the Earth, the Earth, I can see so much of it that the Earth starts to look a little bit smaller. But when I look out into the distance, into space, and I look at the stars, and I see the sun, and I see the moon, they're about the same thing that you see on the ground. I'm only 250 miles above the Earth, so not that far above the Earth. Even though I'm going super fast, I'm still only 250 miles above the Earth. So this moon is about the same size, the sun's about the same size, but what I can tell you is you definitely feel the sun. Once it rises up over the Earth, you can feel the heat of the sun and the power of it. Uh, I think much more than you feel on a sunrise on the ground. I'm Jaden Fallis from Hoxie. I'm in sixth grade. I'm asking this question for Kenzie Norndorf, who is in first grade. How long does it take to get your spacesuit on? So we have a several spacesuits. One of the spacesuits I fly in in order to come up to the space station or to go down uh, from the space station in my Soyuz uh, spacecraft. And that one takes about five minutes to put on, and I can put it on by myself. But when we go outside to do a spacewalk, that requires a whole different type of spacesuit because that spacesuit has to have all the oxygen I need. It has to be able to scrub out all my carbon dioxide, and I have to have water in there to help me cool, and I have to have batteries for power. And so that's like its own little mini spacecraft. And to put that on and get all checked out and then finally go outside for a spacewalk takes about five hours. I'm Nick Robin from Hoxie. I'm in fifth grade. What do you miss most about Earth? So without doubt, the thing I miss most is being with family. If I could bring my family up here with me, this would be a, an amazing uh, a vacation to take with them. Uh, so I can't wait to get home and, and, and hug my wife and, and hug my sons and say hi to all my family. Uh, it's the thing I miss the most. I'm Nathan Whitka 
I'm homeschooled and I'm in fifth grade. How has your perspective changed now that you are looking down on the earth? So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, and I think that that it, the perspective up here of being able to look down and see the earth, I'm up high enough that during daytime, when I'm looking down on the ground and it's, it's in the sun's light, it's very difficult to see cities. Uh, you know, I can fly over the Great Plains and, you know, coming over the Rockies, I have to look really hard in order to try to find Denver. And it's very easy to go from Denver all the way down to the Gulf, down to Houston. It only takes us about three minutes and we fly over all of that and all I see are fields and fields of crops. So this high up, you start to realize how small each one of us really is in the world, but also how we're all connected and part of it. And so it just makes the earth seem much more special in, in how we're part of the earth. And then you look out into deep space and you see those stars are still little points of light. And you start to realize that space is really big. And so we've got this, this wonderful little island that we live on in this really vast dark ocean of space. I'm Genesis Harvey from Hoxie. I'm in seventh grade. How does it feel coming from such a small town and doing something big and cool with your life? So I can't say that I saw everything that was going to happen. You know, it was, it was 30 years ago that I, that I was going to school in Hoxie. And, and if you'd asked me then everything that has happened between then and now that was going to get me here today, I couldn't have predicted it. So I feel very fortunate. But I, I think it's also important to realize that, you know, big dreams, you, you don't achieve big dreams by making one decision and saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. You, you achieve those dreams by waking up every day and taking one small step closer to that dream. So I encourage all of you to find what you're passionate about. Set that goal and then every day be intentional and make one small step closer. It's step by step, approach that dream. It's not going to be leaps and bounds and progress is going to be slow and sometimes it's backwards, but you'll keep going. And, and it's only through that persistence and that commitment that you're going to be able to achieve those dreams. And, you know, it also takes a little bit of luck as well. Hi, I am Gavin Shippers. I'm from Hoxley. I'm in seventh grade. Were you scared when the launch anomaly occurred on your first launch? So I'd be lying if I didn't say I wasn't a little scared when, uh, you know, we were... We were on the rocket. We were, we were, you know, 30 kilometers in the air, going 4,000 miles per hour, and the rocket blew up that we were riding on top of. So it was a pretty traumatic event. But what helped get me through it was all of the training, and the you know there, there's I mentioned this vast team. So there's this team across the globe that had spent the better part of five years training me for this mission. And when I needed to do the procedures that I needed to do during the abort, all of their training just came right to the front of my mind. And I knew that that's what I needed to focus on in order to, to, to have the best chance for being successful. And so with my commander, Alexei and I, we just started doing the things that we had trained to do. And it had been my experience in the Air Force, so I'm active duty Air Force. It had been my experience in all the, the different situations I'd been exposed to during my service in the Air Force, whether deployed or doing flight tests. In those high stress situations, learning to trust the training and to rely on the training, uh, it, it's really what kicked in. And uh, I'm just thankful for all the hours, the, you know, the countless hours and the, the, and the throngs of people that spent time getting me ready for that moment.
I'm Adley Ziegler from Hoxie. I'm in fifth grade. I'm asking this question for Helena Heskett, who is in fourth grade. Do you have plans to visit your hometown of Hoxie when you return to Earth? I can say with 100% confidence, yes. I, I also hope to visit Peabody too. Hi, I'm Skylar Tremblay from Hoxie. I'm in eighth grade. My question is, how does being an astronaut affect your health and life insurance? <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, so being an astronaut does affect your ability to find someone willing to insure you. And after having a launch abort in October, uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be difficult for me to find anybody that's going to be willing to take a life insurance policy out on me. Well, Nico, time to sign off. Thanks for sharing your amazing space experience with us. Thanks to all the astronauts on station for all the important and impactful things you do. And finally, thanks to all the incredible people at NASA who do what they do so you can live your dream. Love you. Orbit safe. Thanks, Mom. You know, I know it's a couple days early, but I, I have to say happy Mother's Day. Uh, thank you for everything that you've done to support me throughout the years. Uh, it's the reason that I'm here. And uh, for all those in the audience there, uh, Mother's Day is this weekend. Take some time to to reach out to the, the special women that are in your lives and let them know how much you appreciate them. This is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all the participants from the Kansas Cosmosphere. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Thank you.